Thank you everyone for being here this evening. Um, I, uh, my name is Elizabeth. I am a Projects uh, Learning and Live Research Curator at uh, App Projects, which is a public art commissioning organization based in London, um, but active nationally. Um, I am a white woman with curly, long brown hair, uh, wearing a black dress, and I go by the pronouns of she, her. Um, this event is happening a few days before the reopening on the 17th of May, and um, we are very much looking forward to being able to experience culture in person again, going back to theatres and cinemas um, and galleries. Um, with this event, we would like to offer some thoughts of how we've developed operationally in response to COVID over the past year and how digital methods can be integrated into the way we access culture today as uh, additional tools to reach people in an accessible and uh, participatory way. So um, this event has really come together in response to the development of the hall, which is the digital platform that we have all accessed this evening which has been realized with the public funding awarded by uh, the Arts Council Emergency Fund last year. Um, so much of our work as a public art commissioner, uh, commissioning organization involves participatory processes and uh, community engagements, but the restrictions related to COVID have meant that a lot of our work um, had to stop um, because we weren't able to do and organize face-to-face -face engagements. So we've um, developed the whole um, with the idea of a community center in mind. Uh, it wants to be like a civic digital space that enables participation and engagement by combining the two digital platforms, like Lily was, was saying earlier, which include polling and Q&A questions uh, and whiteboards alongside the video conferencing. Um, so the hall really wants to be a, a space where ideas can be put forward, heard, and discussed. Um, as part of the development of the hall, we've started we scrutinized notions of participation, culture, and democracy. What they mean, what they mean to us, but also how they can inform the socially engaged work that we do. So we started asking questions such as, does culture promote democracy and, and how? Um, but more specifically, what type of democracy we're talking about? Is it the participatory democracy that originated in ancient Greece in fifth century BC? Or is it the representative democracy which operates in Western societies today? So with this event, we wanted to test out uh, new possibilities, introducing a theater performance by uh, the theater company Out of Chaos alongside a more traditional panel of speakers. And um, we will draw a parallel between ancient Greek theater and socially engaged art, exploring if and how culture, whether that is ancient or contemporary, can enable democratic decision-making processes. So um, we will have uh, two presentations, uh, one by Professor Paul Cartledge and, um, and one by Harold Doffey. Uh, who will explore if there is a, a relationship between culture and, and democracy in ancient Greek theater and uh, today. After the presentations, we will have a 20 minute performance by the theater company Out of Chaos, which I will introduce after the, the presentations by the speakers. And then finally, there will be a panel discussion after the play um, so if you have any questions for the panel discussion at the end of the event, just pop in your questions in the slider bar on the right of your screen. Um, and I will make sure to take as many questions as time allows. Um, and then, of course, if you've got any feedback for our projects about the event, there will be an opportunity for you to uh, feedback in the questionnaire at the end um, available. So I will briefly do a, uh, an introduction to the speakers before uh, passing the words to Professor Paul Cartledge. Um, Professor Paul Cartledge is A.G. Leventis Senior Research Fellow at, uh, of Clare College, Cambridge, and President of the Society for the, Promo for the Promotion of Hellenic Studies. He is author, co-author, editor, or co-editor 
of some 30 books, the most recent being Democracy a Life, um, published by Oxford University Press in 2018, and Thebes, The Forgotten City of Ancient Greece, published by Picador 2020. Professor Paul Cartledge has been awarded the Gold Cross of the Order of Honor in Greece and is an honorary citizen of modern Sparta. Harold Offe is an artist working in a range of media, including performance, video, photography, learning, and social arts practice. Harold is interested in the space created by the inhabiting or embodying of histories. Of histories. He employs humor as a means to confront the viewer with historical narratives and contemporary culture. He is exhibited widely in the UK and internationally, including Take Britain and Take Modern, South London Gallery, Turf Projects, Kettles Yard, Wising Arts Centre, Studio Museum Harlem, um, MAC VAL in France, Kunsthal um, Charlottenburg in Denmark, and uh, Art Tower Mito in Japan. He lives in Cambridge and works in London and Leeds, where he's currently a reader in fine art at Leeds Beckett University and a tutor in contemporary art practice at the Royal College of Art in London. Upcoming projects include a new video commission exploring the redemptive power of joy through social dance for the Welcome Collection in London. Offer will be exhibited, uh, exhibiting as part of Untitled Art on the Conditions of Our Time, a major group exhibition of British artists of African descent at Kettle's Yard in Cambridge. Hail the New Prophets will see Offer realize his first major public sculpture as part of the Bold Tendencies exhibition in Peckham, London. So, so without further ado, I'm going to pass the word to Paul for his presentation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I am a white man, rather ancient, sadly, 74, a bit grizzled. Those of you who have vision <clears throat> can see behind me uh, an image of the Parthenon in Athens, which I will refer to later. I am actually not in Athens. I'm speaking to you from South Cambridge. I'm a professor of ancient Greek culture especially ancient Athenian democratic culture of the fifth century BC or BCE. But I am also a passionate fan of live theater. And we've not had much of that recently. A cultural practice, which of course had its origins 2,500 years ago in Athens at the foot of the sacred Acropolis, which is why I was thrilled and honored to be invited by Elizabeth and by Lily to take part in this very exciting panel discussion and to do so with the uber distinguished Harold Offer. In 10 minutes, one can't go altogether fully into every nook and nuance of ancient Athenian 5th century BCE theater with special reference to Sophocles' Antigone of, well, perhaps 440 BC, BCE. So let me first uh, spell out in skeleton outline my two headline themes or theses before I try to put a little flesh on them. Headline theme or thesis number one, ancient fifth century BCE Athens was a foreign country. They did things very differently there across the board. So one of my main aims with you is to defamiliarize. Yes, the Athenians invented the earliest version of our drama and theater, but they did so in a radically different context. Headline theme or thesis number two, the specific context in which theater, not just tragedy, but also satire, drama, and comedy was invented at Athens, was a democratic context. And the Athenians too invented the ultimate ancestor of our Western notions and practices of democracy. But their democracy was not ours in all sorts of ways. Let me just specify two of those ways. First, their versions of democracy, meaning literally people power, were all direct, whereas ours are all indirect. 
act that is representative. In ancient Athens, we the people ruled. They didn't choose others to rule instead of them. Second major difference. In ancient Athens, religion was polytheistic, not monotheistic. And there was no separation, as there is at least in principle today, between church and state, because there was no church in ancient Athens. So democratic politics could also be, and was, religious politics. And that's exactly what Sophocles' play Antigone was, a key part of a state-run democratic religious festival in honor of Dionysos, Dionysus, Bacchus, shape-shifting god of metamorphosis and wine. In case those differences between their theater and ours aren't yet enough for you, here are a couple more. First, their theater was staged outside in daylight hours at the end of March, beginning of April, so that not only was there no separation between the stage and the performers on it and the audience, but the audience, also by the way called theatron, that's where we get our word theatre from, the audience of what, 15,000 maybe, two and a half times the size of the Albert Hall, they could all see and interact with each other. They were a vital element of the productions as a whole, rather as fans of soccer clubs are vital ingredients of soccer clubs today. And ancient Athenian audiences were notoriously noisy, partly because they were uh, present not only amongst themselves, but also with numbers of um, persons who visited Athens specifically for the theatre, coming from other Greek cities, and there were about a thousand Greek cities altogether. Second major difference in terms of performance, all speakers, actors, all chorus members were masked. They were, wore full head masks. There are only three or four maximum speaking actors, all of them male. There were 12 or 15 chorus members, and often the chorus gave its name to the play. I'll give you one example. Aeschylus's Persians, the oldest surviving ancient Athenian Greek tragedy. Antigone, named for its protagonist, was unusual in this, as in indeed many other respects. Third major difference, Athenian tragic playwrights like so Sophocles had to compose not just one, but four plays. So Antigone, the play, wasn't a standalone and it wouldn't have been judged alone. And the playwright was not only the playwright, but also the composer, the choreographer, and very often the director. Now I used the word judged just a moment ago. By that, I mean quite literally. A random selection of audience members chosen by the democratic method of the lot voted for which set of plays by the usually three competing playwrights they thought was the best and which actor was in their view deserving of the, as it were, Oscar. Very democratic. Enough about background. The play's the thing, as I believe someone once said. Well, in Greek, drama meant the thing done. What about Antigone? Though it's an Athenian play, it's set in a city that in real time was Athens' deadly enemy, Thebes. And it's set, of course, in a distant mythical Thebes, but in a hugely dysfunctional regal monarchical themes, one that is polluted, polluted not only by incest, Oedipus was of course not just Antigone's father, but also her half-brother, it was polluted also by civil war, and the Antigone play begins when the character Antigone defies the edict of her autocratic uncle, Creon, her mother's brother, not to bury her allegedly traitorous brother, Polynices. 
By the way, Polynikes means much strife, and uh, sometimes names are speaking. Antigone's name could mean against generation against procreation. Well, let's cut to the chase, finally. How political was Sophocles' original Antigone? I mean, to what extent, in what ways, was it a political play? Modern readings, modern productions tend to see it and to play it as political, but in modern ways. For example, individual conscience against bullying state diktat. That is certainly an anachronistic reading. Consider only this. Antigone was a royal princess, only aged about 15 or so. Hardly, therefore, a politically empowered ordinary citizen of Thebes. Far more likely to the point, to what I consider it likely to have been Sophocles' point, is that Antigone stands for the timeless, the divine, the unwritten laws, in this case, the absolute overridingly imperative necessity to bury properly one's kindred dead, no matter what, as against the man-made political laws of mundane humanity, which in democratic Athens were by definition written and publicly displayed. They're human laws and therefore arbitrary and changeable. To conclude, Aeschylus wrote in one of his plays that one learns, or one can, or should learn, by suffering. Well, if Sophocles in about 440 was trying to teach any particular lesson, I suspect it was this, that mortals, mere mortals, us, even mortals as powerful and successful and self-confident as his contemporary Athenians, who, by the way, were building the Parthenon just at the time the play Antigone was put on, they should be very, very careful to get their priorities right. First, divine law, and then a very long way second, human law. No matter how democratic that law might be. That, I believe, was possibly Sophocles' political position. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Harold Offey. Uh, I am a middle-aged black man. I'm wearing a patterned beige uh, top and uh, a stripy black and white cap. And I'm in a room surrounded by uh, books, uh, including Paul's book, uh, A Democratic Life, which I very much recommend. Um, so I am going to talk uh, specifically about uh, a project that I um, developed in 2013, uh, which was commissioned by um, Art on the Underground for the London Underground. Um, I should also just explain in terms of my practice, uh, I work in performance and I work with communities and collaboration often. Um, and this project I'm sort of using as a way to sort of talk about um, socially engaged art and um, which is, uh, I think one of the things that I'm really interested in, I was asked to kind of define socially engaged art is that it's an evolving term. And I think the fact that it's a very contentious area of practice um, and, you know, one can look at the history of um, this area of practice, which is um, was formerly known as community arts. It's been known as participatory practice, uh, participation practice, um, social engaged practice, social arts practice, social practice. And I think in those evolutions, there are I think things to be recognized about um, not only its status, but also um, its its function. Um, but certainly maybe one of the things that I think characterizes um, socially engaged art is uh, notions of participation um, and collaboration, often between artists and communities. Um, and I think 
participation, I think, is a highly politicized term, um, which we could possibly kind of unpack. But um, so I'm going to talk just and I've got some images to show and I'll talk about the specific dynamics of the project that I did with Art on the Underground. So I'll just share my screen. Um, OK, and then. OK, so um, just to give a bit of a narrative context um, to this specific project. Um, so th the project uh, was called Transporter. It was commissioned by Art on the Underground. Um, was part of a, uh, a number of commissions connected to the 100th and 50th anniversary of the London Underground. Um, and I was invited to work with two youth groups based in Northwest London, um, uh, Baraka Youth Association, which is an organization that su supports um, young people of Somali heritage, and the Canal Side Activity Center, which um, is pretty much as it says it is, it's a Canal Side Activity Center where uh, young people can engage in canoeing and kayaking. Um, and these two organizations happen to be located next door to each other um, in the Ladbrook Grove area, but hadn't ever worked together. Um, so the basic premise of the commission was to, um, working with these two organizations and the young people was to develop an artwork for three stations on the underground, um, uh, Ladbrook Grove station, which was the closest to the organizations, uh, Notting Hill Gate, which marked one end of uh, the central line, and Bethnal Green Station, uh, which marked um, was in e East London. Um, and my starting point for the project was actually uh, a reference to the American jazz musician Sun Ra, um, who's now known as a sort of godfather of Afrofuturism, which is a um, a cultural movement that's come to prominence in recent years. Um, but in facilitating the project, I was really interested in trying to start a conversation with the young people about the history of the underground, uh, its 150th anniversary, and uh, not only to connect them to its past, its archives, its narratives, its rich visual culture, um, but also to engage them in thinking about its future. Um, and also to remind them that in many ways, uh, the underground as a Victorian uh, engineering marvel was itself a utopian visionary project, um, which over the years has evolved to serve uh, a growing um, urban center. So as part of the process of uh, working with the young people, um, we did a number of visits uh, to the London Transport Museum to look at archives and posters, but we also visited the stations that we would be designing the artwork for. Um, along the way, the young people used cameras, recording equipment to capture their experiences and their journey, um, but also as a way of facilitating um, their experience of navigating the system. And I think something that I think is important maybe to kind of perhaps a little surprising for me was that uh, many of the young people who were from Northwest London had never been to East London. Uh, some of them had never even been on the underground. Um, so the whole idea of kind of working with the transport network for many of them was very new. Um, so um, over the course of the project, we collected this material um, and uh, then we had a process of trying to collectively decide how we would respond and what our artwork that would be situated in these very public places would look like. Um, and again, uh, I tried to use this kind of framework of thinking about the future as a way into thinking about and, and facilitating the conversation. Um, and ultimately, the work that was produced um, was um, um, a timeline 
that try to imagine each of the stations on the underground uh, from Notting Hill Gate at Notting Hill Gate in um, West London to Bethnal Green in East London. Um, so as a kind of big extended musical score come imaginary future timeline. Um, so ultimately the work was installed at the stations um, from 2013 um, and was in situ for over a year. Um, and uh, as you can see from these images, the walls, uh, the work consisted of these panels. So as um, uh, commuters used and entered and exited the stations, they would uh, walk, uh, well, not walk, but they would move past the images. And the young people really thought very specifically about this experience of their viewers traveling through time and space. <clears throat> and we had several conversations really about the idea that the underground was a sort of matter transporter, um, people shifting through time and space from locations. And they created messages to speak to these uh, commuters. So um, there are these text pieces, there are uh, hidden messages. Um, but based on an experience of being able to do some uh, platform announcements, the young people proposed the idea of creating um, messages for the com commuters that would be broadcast intermittently within the first few months of the project. Um, so they recorded these messages and um, it was amazing to see how these were kind of sort of broadcast. So, I mean, and this is just a kind of short encapsulation of this project and there's a lot more that I could kind of say, but I think one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is in what is afforded by the engagement with cultural production, with creativity. And um, something that I think is particularly important is this thing of participation. And um, also I think in addition to that, the nature of the context of this project, which was situated in a real life public context. So, the young people had to take on the responsibility and role of um, developing their research, exploring sources and evidence, collectively discussing and working together to make decisions about ideas. But then like a lot of visual artists, contemporary artists, they had to negotiate uh, a production phase, working with designers to develop and manufacture a design that would exist in a real uh, functioning space um, would and that would have to be seen over um, the course of a year. Um, and then they had to deal with the presentation and reception of that through public outcomes like uh, an opening reception um, and an opportunity to speak to journalists and discuss what they've done. Um, so for me, I think I'm really interested in what is afforded by that participation in cultural production, in the development of those uh, critical analytical skills, uh, production skills and communication skills. Um, and uh, I think, there is something I think to be said really about the kind of ownership that is afforded by this. But I mean, it's easy to be quite glib, I think, and, and, and say this is a very one-off project. And um, I wouldn't necessarily claim that this transformed the lives of the young people. I think something that I would like to talk about is how that this has to be part of a more holistic process of education, um, of opportunities um, in, in order, I think, to really, I think, reinforce um, the tools and skills and experiences that might come out of uh, a participation and engagement with the arts and creativity. Um, okay, I'm gonna come out of this. Uh, okay. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna stop there. I think I've gone a little bit over time. Thanks so much, Harold. And um, of course, thank you, Paul, for the very insightful presentations. Um, it was really great to hear um, Harold just now.
about the questions you've raised, what is afforded by that type of presentations? What kind of skills do we, but that type of participation, sorry, what kind of skills do we develop? And um, um, yeah, it was great to hear um, about uh, that type of engagement and participation, both in um, contemporary life, contemporary culture through your socially engaged art project, Harold, and also the audience participation that um, was experienced in uh, ancient Athens through theatre. Um, Paul Cartledge talked about um, um, there being almost no distinction between the audience and the actors. Um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure there's a better way of saying this, but um, um, that participatory role of the audience and, and what that affords. I um, am very pleased now to introduce you to the theatre company, Out of Chaos, uh, who will present a 20 minute long adapted version of the ancient Greek play Antigone by Sophocles. Um, we have chosen the Antigone because it is framed as a play of resistance um, and it gives us insight into the inner conflict that most of us, if not all of us, experience and have especially experienced over the past year that conflict between the private and the, and the public, uh, between the interest of the individual and that of the collective, um, represented respectively by Antigone and Creon. Um, my interest as an individual don't often align with the interests of the collective of the common goods. So what happens when that happens? What do we do when that happens? And how do we reconcile these interests? Um, just wanted to let you know, we have added a participatory element to display in case you wish to contribute. Um, and your contributions will be anonymous. Um, so we wanted to let you know that uh, a couple of questions will be popping up during the play in your poll tab on Slido. So in case you cannot see Slido already, um, just um, switch your layout to 2-1. To um, there's a button on the top right, just make sure it says 2-1. And also make sure you click on the poll tab. Um, it says Q&A and poll tab, just make sure you click on the q and uh, on the poll tab, so that you will definitely see the questions. Um, out of chaos make work which is exciting, challenging and generous, with a belief in the joy of storytelling in creative and surprising forms. During lockdown, Out of Chaos created Reading Greek Tragedy Online, working with the Center for Hellenic Studies at Harvard University to stage every extant Greek tragedy online in the space of nine months, bringing together the talents of more than 120 artists from around the world. The play is directed by Paul um, Maoni and will feature Tim Delap, Tabitha Gale, Natasha Majigi, um, and um, Paul Omaoni himself. Uh, the play was translated by Paul Woodruff, uh, courtesy of Hackett's Publishing Company. Um, so yeah, please do enjoy. I am a Theban, a citizen of Thebes. I'm a middle-aged white man, bald, wearing a simple white shirt, my pronouns are he, him. Welcome to Thebes, a city, a state, a city-state in Greece. We're about one day's march northwest from Athens, but that's the least of our problems. You see, we Thebans, we're cursed. It started when Laius was king. He was married to Jocasta, and there was a prophecy that any son they had would end up killing Laius and marrying Jocasta. Impossible to imagine. So they had a son. And given the prophecy, they did what they had to do. They disposed of it, or rather they got someone else to dispose of it. The man they gave the child to took pity on it and passed the baby to a shepherd who worked for another royal family, the king and queen of Corinth. The king and queen of Corinth were childless, and they welcomed that baby with open arms. But prophecy knows. This child was called Oedipus. 
you'll have heard of him perhaps. Oedipus grew up and left Corinth, but got into an argument with an old man at a crossroads near Delphi. Oedipus killed this old man, although he never asked what his name was. If he had, the old man would have told Oedipus he was called Laius, king of Thebes. Oedipus then came here to Thebes. We were in a terrible way then, too. Our king had disappeared and we were terrorised by a sphinx who killed anyone who couldn't solve her riddle. Oedipus could solve the riddle, though. So we made him king and gave him a wife, our queen, Jocasta, his mother, Jocasta. The unspeakable happened. They had four children, two boys, two girls. No one knew. But then a plague came. We were trapped, panicked, afraid. We were told there was a pollution in the city and that only by removing it could we be free. The truth came out slowly, painfully, cruelly. Oedipus came to understand that he had killed his own father. Jocasta realised she had married her own son. She killed herself. He gouged out his own eyes. Oedipus ended his days a wanderer until he at last found peace at Colonus. But there was no peace for us Thebans. His two sons grew up, Polynices and Eteocles, each as unpleasant as the other was ambitious. It was decided they would share the throne, taking it in turns to rule, but Eteocles refused to budge and Polynices raised an army and attacked his own city, wanting to take back control. The two brothers killed each other. So who was left? Oedipus and Jocasta had two sons and two daughters, remember. Enter Antigone and Ismene. I am Antigone. I'm a black woman dressed in black with an afro. I am Ismini. I am a black woman with dark brown hair, braided. I'm wearing a black polo neck shirt. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Antigone and Ismini were left to bury the dead, except the new king. Enter Creon. Creon, who was the brother of Jocasta, the uncle of Antigone, Ismene, Eteocles and Polynices, decreed that Polynices was a traitor who had attacked his own city and therefore no one was to bury him, not even with the most basic of ceremonies. Instead, his body would remain outside the city walls to be eaten by animals. It's after this decree from Creon that Antigone and her sister Ismene meet. Ismene, dear heart, my true sister, you and I are left alive to pay the final penalty to Zeus for Oedipus. I've never seen such misery and madness. It's monstrous. Such deep shame and dishonor as this, which falls upon the pair of us. They say the general has plastered it around the city. Have you heard this terrible news or not? Our enemies are on the march to hurt our friends. No, Antigone. I have had no news of friends, nothing sweet or painful since the day we lost our brothers, both of us, on one day, both brothers dead by their two hands. I knew it. That's the whole reason I brought you outside, to hear the news alone. Well, tell me, you're as clear as a fog at sea. It's the burial of our two brothers. Creon promotes one of them and shames the other. Ateocles I heard Creon covered him beneath the earth with proper rights, as law ordains. So he has honor down among the dead, but Polynices' miserable corpse. They say Creon has proclaimed to everyone no burial of any kind, no wailing, no public tears. Give him to the vultures, unwept, unburied, to be a sweet treasure for their sharp eyes and beaks. That's what they say the good Creon has proclaimed to me and to you. 
He forbids me too. And now he's strutting here to make it plain to those who haven't heard. He takes this seriously, that if anyone does what he forbids, he'll have him publicly stoned to death. There's your news. Now, show your colors. Are you true to your birth or a coward? You take things hard. If we are in this news, what could I do to loosen or pull the knot? If you share the work and the trouble. In what dangerous adventure? If you help this hand raise the corpse. Do you mean to bury him? Against the city's ordinance? But he is mine and yours. Oh, no. Think carefully, my sister. Our father died in hatred and disgrace after gouging out his own two eyes for sins he'd seen in his own self. Next, his mother and wife, she was both, destroyed herself in a knotted rope. And third, our two brothers on one day killed each other in a terrible calamity which they had created for each other. Now think about the two of us. We are alone. How horrible it will be to die outside the law if we violate a dictator's decree. No, we have to keep this fact in mind. We are women and we do not fight with men. We're subject to them because they are strong and we must obey this order even if it hurts us more. As for me, I will say to those beneath the earth this prayer. Forgive me, I am held back by force. I, I won't press you any further. I wouldn't even let you help me if you had a change of heart. Go on and be the way you choose to be. I will bury him. I will have a noble death and lie with him, a dear sister with a dear brother. Call it a crime of reverence, but I must be good to those who are below. I will be there longer than with you. Please, uh, don't tell a soul what you were doing. Keep it hidden. I'll do the same. For God's sake, speak out. You'll be more enemy to me if you're silent. Proclaim it to the world. Your heart's so hot to do this chilling thing. But it pleases those who matter most. Yes, if you had the power but you love the impossible. So, when my strength is gone, I'll stop. So you just let me and my bad judgment go to hell. Nothing could happen to me that's half as bad as dying a coward's death. We have to make decisions every day. Most of them are trivial, but when you're a citizen, your decisions are crucial. Sometimes we can only exist as a state if we make collective decisions or if we follow certain instructions. But what if we believe the instructions are wrong? What happens when our responsibilities as a citizen clash with our values as a person? Do you agree with Antigone? Is this what good trouble looks like? What would you do? No, I'm asking you, what would you do? Here's a question. Should Antigone follow the commands she disagrees with for the good of the community? And you can vote now. Should Antigone follow the commands she disagrees with for the good of the community? Tragedy happens when we don't have time, when we're forced into action without the luxury of reflection. And that's why watching tragedy prepares us for making decisions under pressure. We can examine our values, question ourselves. What questions would you ask? And Antigone makes her decision. She chooses the divine law 
and gives Polynices burial. She disobeys. And when Creon learns his order has been broken, he condemns the perpetrator to death. The guards then bring that perpetrator in front of Creon. I am Creon. I'm a white man with a dark top and dark brown hair. The new king stands face to face with his niece, Antigone. You there, with your head bowed to the ground, are you guilty? Or do you deny that you did this thing? Of course not, I did it. I won't deny anything. Tell me, in brief, not at length, did you know that this had been forbidden? I knew. I couldn't help knowing it was everywhere. And yet you dare to violate these laws. What laws? I, I never heard it was Zeus who made that announcement and it wasn't justice either. The gods below didn't lay down this law for human use. And I never thought your announcements could give you, a mere human being, power to trample the gods' unfailing, unwritten laws. These laws weren't made now or yesterday. They live for all time. And no one knows when they came into the light. No man could frighten me into taking on the gods' penalty for breaking such a law. I'll die in any case, of course I will, whether you announce my execution or not. But if I die young, all the better. People who live in misery like mine are better dead. So if that's the way my life will end, the pain is nothing. But if I let the corpse, my mother's son, lie dead, unburied, that would be agony. This way, no agony for me, but you, you think that I've been a fool? It takes a fool to think that. Now, we see the girls as wild by birth as her father. She has no idea how to bow her head to trouble. Don't forget, the mind that is most rigid stumbles soonest. The hardest iron tempered in fire till it is super strong shatters easily and clatters into shards. This girl was a complete expert in arrogance already when she broke established law. And now, arrogantly, she adds insult to injury. She's boasting and sneering about what she's done. Listen, if she's not punished for taking the upper hand, then I am not a man. She would be a man. I don't care if she's my sister's child or closer yet at my household shrine for Zeus. She and her sister must pay the full price and die for their crime. Yes, I say they have equal guilt, conniving one with the other for this burial. Bring her out. I saw her in there a minute ago. She was raving mad, totally out of her mind. You've caught me. You can kill me. What more do you want? For me, that's everything. I want no more than that. Then what are you waiting for? More talk? Your, your words disgust me. I hope they always will. And I'm sure you're disgusted by what I say. But yet, speaking of glory, what could be more glorious than giving my true brother his burial? All these men would tell you they're rejoicing over that if you hadn't locked their tongues with fear. But a tyrant says and does what he pleases. That's his great joy. You are the only one in all of things who thinks that way. No, they all see it the same. You silence them. Aren't you ashamed to have a mind apart from theirs? There's no shame in having respect for a brother. Wasn't he your brother too? The one who died on the other side? Yes, my blood brother. The same mother, same father. When you honor the one, you disgrace the other. Why do it? The dead will never testify against a burial. Yes, if they were equal. But one of them deserves disgrace. He wasn't any kind of slave. He was his brother who died. He was killing and plundering. The other one defended our land. Even so, Hades longs to have these laws obeyed. But surely not equal treatment for good and bad. Who knows? Down below, that might be blessed. An enemy is always an enemy, even in death. I cannot side with hatred. My nature sides with love. Go to Hades, then. And if you have to love, love someone dead. As long as I live, I will not be ruled by a woman. 
Now is me niece stands before the doors and sheds tears of sister love. From her brows, a blood dark cloud casts a foul shadow and stains her lovely face. Now you, hiding in my house like a snake, a coiled bloodsucker in the dark. And I never realized I was raising a pair of deadly crazed revolutionaries. Come, tell me, how do you plead? Guilty of this burial as an accomplice, or do you swear you knew nothing? I did it, I confess. That is, if we are partners anyway, I am an accomplice and I bear responsibility with her. I will oh. not permit this penalty to fall on you. No, I never wanted to give you a share. But there are your troubles. I am not ashamed. I'll be your shipmate in suffering. I have witnesses. The gods below saw who did the work and I won't accept a friend who's only friends in words. No, please. You're my sister. Don't despise me. Let me die with you and sanctify our dead. No, you may not die along with me. Don't say that you did it. You wouldn't even touch it. Now leave my death alone. Why would I care to live when you are gone? Creon's the one to ask. He's the one you care for. Why are you scolding me? It won't help you. Of course not. It hurts me when my mockery strikes you. But still, I want to help you. What can I do? Escape. Save yourself. I don't begrudge you that. Just be brave. You're alive. Already my soul is dead. It's gone to help those who died before me. What a pair of children. One of you lost her mind moments ago. The other was born without hers. That is right, sir. Whenever we commit a crime, our minds, which grew by nature, leaves us. Yours did, when you deliberately joined a criminal in crime. Without her, why should I live? I'd be alone. Her? Don't speak of her. She is no more. But will you really kill the bride of your son? There's other ground for him to plough, you know. <sighs> but no one is so suited to him as well as she is. I loathe bad women. She's not for my son. <laughs> oh, Haman, dearest. What a disgrace your father does to you. Shut up! What a pain you are, you and your marriage. Will you really take away your son's bride? Not me. Death will put a stop to this marriage. So she will die? Has it really been decided? Yes, by you and me. Now. No more delays. And now, another question. In one or two words, how did you feel the last time you experienced conflict and disagreement? Because in this conflict, neither side budges. They're trapped on a course of mutually assured destruction. Creon's son, Hymen, who is engaged to Antigone, pleads for her pardon, he's denied. Creon is warned that his actions are putting the city in peril, that even the gods are turning against him. And after being urged by his citizens, he at last relents and rushes to undo his commands. He orders the burial of Polynices. But now, picture a cave with Antigone inside, a cave outside the city. Antigone has hanged herself. Hymen is there, but too late to save her. When Creon arrives, Hymen tries to kill him, but he fails. So Hymen turns the sword on himself and dies. Creon has lost his son and his niece in quick succession. And then he loses his wife. Eurydice hears of Hymen's death and she too takes her own life. And the very last thing we're told is that punishment brings wisdom. Does it? Thank you so much. Thank you um, to the actors and of course to um, Paul um, who's directed the play. Um, we started talking about um, 
putting up this event online uh, back in November. So it's really, really, it feels great to, to see it happening live, um, finally. Um, so we're going to begin our panel discussion um, with um, Paul Cartledge and Harold Doffe. So um, I will start by asking Paul and Harold uh, a few questions. Uh, but if you do have any questions for the panel, uh, just do um, write them up in the Q&A tab on the Slido, and um, I'll take them slightly later. Um, what was interesting about this play, and that's also the reason why we chose it, is because it presents two opposed, equally valid views. Uh, the one by Creon that represents the collective, um, the government, let's say, um, and then the one by Antigone, which uh, represents the view on the individual. And we were asked as members of the audience to, to make a decision. Um, and I've made a note that 70% of audience um, replied to Antigone should not follow Creon's um, commands, whereas 30% did. 30% of, of the audience this evening um, voted um, um, for Antigone to follow the common goods or what um, is considered a common good. So I have a question for Paul. Um, and I was hoping, and you briefly touched upon it earlier during the presentation, but I was wondering if you could tell us about a, um, a bit more about um, the different models of democracy, um, direct participatory on the one hand and the representative on the other, but also more specifically, if, if it is possible to say that theater in ancient Athens was an exercise in democracy. Very directly, and that's not meant to be just a pun. They lacked our technology the economic and social and technological base of the 5th century BC Athens was radically inferior to anything that we're familiar with today, which is one reason, only partly, but part of the, the reason why they had slaves. And the Athenians had not just private slaves, individually owned, but a body of public slaves who enabled functions such as the theatrical uh, festival of which, by the way, there were two to happen every, uh, every year. It was democratic because the very first decision that the official whose name gave his name to the civil year, we say we're in 2021, they said we're in the year of X, let's say I'll pluck a name from the sky, Archippos. And that was how you remembered what happened in which year, in the archonship of Archippus. Well, I chose that name partly because it means he who leads through horses. It's a, a very aristocratic name. But the very first decision that that person who was chosen by lot, democratic method, random, not election, the ancients thought elections were aristocratic, oligarchic, whereas we think elections are democratic, they didn't. Chosen by lot, his first decision was to give a chorus to, and then talking about tragedy, the three tragic playwrights, who then were funded by wealthy Athenians who owned property above a certain minimum amount, which meant they had to pay as a kind of super tax for the chorus, their accommodation, their clothing, the props. And it was a six month preparation from the beginning of the civil year, late summer, early autumn, to, as I've said, March, April. Well, you can't get more political, more democratic than you have a civic religious festival that is so embedded in the civic calendar that the very first decision that the chief, chosen official appointed by lot makes is about theater. I can go on. Would you like me to go on? Yes, yes. I mean, it would be really great to unpack this, um, this relationship. How, 
you know, what do we mean by, um, you know, the ancient Greek tragedies when we say that they're highly politicized? Right. Um, and um, what is that relationship with, with the audience? Why, why do we call it participatory? Well, let's start from the very term democratia, which means the power of the masses or the power of all the people. Uh, the word is actually ambiguous and ambivalent. And if you take it in its class sense, democracy is the rule of the masses, the poor, over the elite. And that is how, if you're a radical ideological democrat, you see democracy. It's a great triumph after the previous types of regime, oligarchy, rule of the rich, monarchy, autocracy, tyranny, rule of one man, non-responsibly. In the 460s, there was a great upheaval, a terrific revolution, a second revolution. Athens became more democratic. That's about 20 years before the Antigone. Immediately after the revolution of 462 to 1, one of the main authors, Ephialtes, was murdered. So in other words, we're in a very fraught, tense um, political civic uh, context. Now, how does theatre fit into that? Well, it's regular. It comes in particular times of the year. And it's part of a political process. It's judged democratically. In all those ways, it's political. Can one go beyond that to say that the playwrights, and of course we've only got three playwrights out of all the hundreds who actually had their plays performed, whose plays survived, and we only have a tiny percentage of the original plays that were staged. Sophocles, 120, we have seven. Aeschylus, 90, we have seven. Euripides, and so you, I could go on, but we have very, very little to go on. And therefore it's actually very difficult because we weren't, we weren't there, were we? We don't know what the audience reaction. Remember these plays are put on once, once only. Yes, later they're revived, but initially one off as part of a quadrilogy, not trilogy, but a four part uh, production. So it's actually very hard for us to imagine what the political impact of any political play was. The best, the most um, extensive example extant is Aeschylus's Oresteia trilogy. And people argue backwards and forwards, not just what the play's message, as it were, what the resolution at the end of the trilogy means, but what did Aeschylus intend it to mean? That's always, I think, a very, very different uh, matter and probably actually undecipherable and undecidable. Sophocles is generally thought, I'm being very crude here, the least political in terms of having a dogma, having a particular political outlook, being as it were right wing or left wing or centrist. And also, on the other hand, the most in some ways conventionally religious. I mean, we know quite a bit about his personal life. I won't go into that, but he was a priest, for example. So I emphasized in my reading of the Antigone, and I was so pleased that the actors chose that central debate between the unwritten laws and the written laws. But it's not just that, of course. Um, why do I side with Antigone against Creon? Why did 70% go for her? or the character, or what she stood for, because Creon is a, he's a fake, he's a liar. At one point he says, I decided this, which is the fact, he's an autocrat. No one else decides anything in a situation of tyranny. And then he said, didn't he, to the ordinary Creon, I and you passed this law. No, they didn't, he passed it. So if you were an Athenian, you could see a hypocrite and a liar and a tyrant, and you saw that he was Theban. You hated him, and you knew Thebans were not Democrats in the real world. And so, for all these reasons, the I'm guessing the Athenian audience sided um, heavily with Antigone, except Antigone is, well, you know the famous Greek saying from Delphi, nothing in excess? Isn't the Antigone character just a little bit too extreme? I'll leave it like that. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, in a way, 
by showing you the worst possible leader, Creon. Um, the play encourages you to think about what a good leader might do. Um, so I guess that is also the level of participation that uh, these displays were encouraging, kind of like showing opposite views so that um, in watching them, you can negotiate um, what, what might be the right solution. Um, I also wanted to ask um, a question to Harold and kind of bring back the parallel between ancient Greece and contemporary culture. Um, we've seen how um, ancient, ancient Athens um, was nurturing democratic thinking through plays, through theater. And, and I guess the question is, in today's Western society, um, how are democratic thinking processes nurtured and encouraged? not just in the public forum when it comes to voting or expressing a political opinion, but also in the workplace, the family and other institutions of civil society. Um, does the education that we receive equip us with the right skills to apply the principles of democracy? And um, do art and culture play a role in improving the quality of that education? Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, I mean, that's um, a question. I mean, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll go just straight to the heart of the concern for me, which I think is education. Um, and um, it's interesting to hear Paul talking about that, that um, effect of the theatre um, and showing those models um, of governance. Um, so having that example of um, the dictator, the tyrant, um, that perhaps throws into relief the Athenian democracy. Um, and again, to me, that speaks to the sort of um, reflective and critical thinking that comes with the arts or an, an encounter with the arts. You know, I think, um, I think this is why we um, listen to music or, or enjoy plays, or films or, um, novels, literature, is that um, they equip us with the tools to reflect on our own lives and uh, they equip us with those tools of critical thinking to kind of evaluate our position within the world and uh, I hope they engender curiosity um, and argument and, and, and debate and discussion. Um, so for me I think they, those, those things are kind of central but I think they're also intrinsically linked to education. And um, uh, I mean, that, for me, it's interesting to think about the kind of sort of, you know, um, historically, and Paul can speak much better to this than I can, but like, um, the, you know, the barriers to forms of um, democracy or participation in democracy has often been um, education, you know, are you able to write? Are you able to, you know, uh, do you have a certain level of education? Um, obviously there are economic considerations, land owning and other things have been, but um, even, you know, even today um, in supposedly uh, <laughs> quite well-developed democracies, Western democracies, um, you know, so uh, so for me, that's a kind of very central thing is that, is that, um, particularly within, uh, I think, a, a modern Western democracy, do, do the participants in that democracy, are they equipped with those critical tools of evaluation, of reflection, that allow them to question and challenge and evaluate uh, the, 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 the kind of narratives, the propaganda, the different positions that are being presented to us? Um, and, um, I, you know, I think that that's that's the kind of very crucial question at this point in time. And I think something that I find interesting is what is beginning to emerge in the area of education, which is, I think, the erosion of um, access and provision to the arts. Um, um, I mean, excuse me getting on a sort of like political soapbox, but I, I mean, I, I can't sort of really speak to this without really being aware of the sort of government's current 
consultation about cutting funding to um, uh, certain arts courses at a uh, higher education level. So uh, Gavin Williamson's instigated this consultation specifically focused on the creative arts. So we've just seen a, an amazing um, um, dramatic production um, with fantastic actors. And, you know, this legisl possible legislation, art and design, media studies, but also archaeology, which is, you know, so, I mean, I think that to me speaks to what what is it about the agenda within uh, the political establishment that seeks to disenfranchise, I think, the creative arts, um, not only at higher education level, like you can map this down, I mean, I work a lot in schools, secondary schools, where um, provision of the arts is very inconsistent now. You might be in one school where you might only do either music, drama, art once every two weeks, you know, which is radically different to my own educational experience in the late 80s and 90s. Um, and I think for me, there's something about the erosion of access to these um, these pedagogical tools that come with participation in the arts, um, which is that critical thinking, um, which is that engendering of curiosity, which is those reflective skills and experiences that come about from that participation that I find really worrying and really troubling in terms of the health of our democracy. Thank you so much, Harold. Um, Paul, I, I saw you nodding there. Um, what, um, what would a society where art and culture are not actively promoted look like from the perspective of democracy? Um, I agreed with absolutely everything Harold uh, said, when, and he said it very, very beautifully. And I was gonna make a point which may seem paradoxical or uh, even ironic, uh, going back to the ancients, not many Athenian boys, as they're coming up through their uh, teens, actually went to school, formally speaking. So education was more socialization, and it was socialization within a specifically democratic, that is egalitarian and free, context so long as so long as you were male pre-born not a slave and you were reasonably not not wealthy but um, not destitute and so long as you were civic minded and the way in which the athenians did this was they started from the local level i mean we today don't we we rather disvalue local government. We don't see it as so essential a part of what our polity and politics are as what goes in in Westminster, in Edinburgh, in Cardiff and so on. But for the ancients they are born and it's part of their name. First their father's name, then where they're from, which village ward parish they are ascribed to. And so a demos, <laughs> it's very difficult for outsiders to understand, but a demos was not just the people or a section of the people, but also this village, this where you are originally inscribed. And so education is participation in public phenomena of what you and I would call a cultural kind, religion, lots of festivals, tons of them, including poetry, including dancing. And so theater is merely, uh, but of course, in a way it's the peak, the pinnacle, a formalization of lots of other things that ordinary people do, take part in a chorus, take part in a choral dance, recite poetry, learn Homer, recite it in public, but only relatively very few can act or be in a chorus. So this is where the point that I made as Elizabeth picked up between the relative lack of separation between what goes on on the stage and in the orchestra, the dancing space where the chorus dance and the audience. 
aspects where they're all part of one thing is much more important in terms of interactive education. And so theater in ancient Athens, though it was only twice a year uh, in the central space, there are local festivals, the local deans have their own theaters in some cases, though only occasional, it's what makes you an Athenian. And so though you might not go to school, and certainly not to secondary school, as it were, O-levels, GCSE and A-levels, nevertheless, you're constantly being educated by the city. And there's a very famous passage, it's of course possibly made up, but anyway, it's put in the mouth of Pericles, and he's giving a funeral oration, which is of course a great civic occasion in a war unfortunately. And he says, Athens is an education for all Greece. And he mentions festivals, and of the festivals, the play festivals were absolutely key as parts of this educational process. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm just going to take some questions from the audience. Um, we've only got eight minutes, so I'm just going to put some of these questions together. Um, so Harold, um, I'm going to read out three questions um, addressed to you. I'd love to hear you speak on Sanra with regard to the project. Um, he's interested in the collective experience through music and creativity. Also, Harold, do you think that theater and performance can help equipping people with these tools? And lastly, um, could you add to this to talk more about the aesthetics of participation in theater specifically being a politicized field. Quite a lot of questions, but yes. Yeah, a lot of questions. Um, I might have to recap on the third one, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, happy to speak to um, Sunra. Um, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with Sunra, but um, yeah, American jazz musician who, um, I think as a very sort of direct political action, um, uh, you know, disavowed his name, um, what African-Americans would call their slave name and developed a whole myth narrative and identity um, that was rooted in um, uh, his belief, uh, however outlandish it was, but that, that um, uh, the African diaspora were from extraterrestrials. Um, and uh, with this myth narrative came a kind of claiming of um, um, ancient Egypt and other African civilizations. Um, and it, while it's a fantastical project, it, for me, what it rep represents as a kind of radical strategy um, as a kind of uh, everyday embodied living performance, you know, so, you know, he, was, he didn't switch on and off this persona. He completely inhabited um this persona and um actually i mean there's an interesting sort of like um quote that uh kojo ashen who's an um, artist and writer part of the otolith group um in his book more brilliant than the sun uh adventures in sonic fictions talks about sun ra um in relation to this idea of like mythopoesis so like self mythologizing and I think for me, that's one of the attractions of Sunrise, this kind of like the political action of um, creating a narrative around your own identity. And for me, Sunrise also it becomes a kind of a, a prophesizer, I think, of the kind of digital age. If we think about what's available to us now in terms of um, social media platforms, multiple identities and personas that can be projected globally, um, simultaneously, parallel in, in tandem, um, uh, but also to do that as a kind of political provocation. Um, I forgot what the second question was, but I'm just aware of time. That theatre and, um, oh, uh, uh, I think theatre and performance, right? Was that, was that? Um, yes. Yeah. What's this? I, I think for me, there's this very crucial thing about just the particip the, the very nature of performing, um, in, in, in relation to this idea of presentness and what comes with that in terms of being situated uh, within a context. Um, so the kind of processes and mechanics of theatre and performance 
um, you know, uh, particularly that are kind of rooted in empathy, so um, an embodiment. So physically, your body in a given situation, often trying to navigate and uh, imagine an alternative scenario or embody an alternative kind of position. Um, and that strikes me as engendering a number of kind of critical and important tools um, through this direct experience of placing your body within a historical or other context. So I think, again, that, that, that I mean, I just, just speaking to the, I think the, you know, the value, the pedagogical value of, I think, the direct and active participation in forms of performance and theatre. Um, and um, I, I've forgotten the last one, forgive me, but I'm, um, I think I might um, pick yeah, up some could, of the other questions on. for Paul. Yeah. But thank you, Harold, um, for answering also so quickly. Sorry if it's slightly rushed. <laughs> um, so, Paul, um, I'm going to read um, some of these questions together. Um, do you think that the play encouraged the audience to think about what good can a dead leader do? What if Antigone decided to live and start a revolution? Um, also, Paul, can you talk more about how the people of Athens chose the performances to be shown to the audience? It's very fascinating. And finally, does the chorus represent also the voice of the people in the play Antigone? Thanks, um, three questions. Yeah, dead leader, uh, Oedipus. Oedipus, um, as was pointed out by Paul O'Mahony, he ends up not too bad. And there's a very specific Sophoclean link. Colonos is actually just outside the city walls of central Athens. And it is the demos, the village, parish, ward of Sophocles. So Sophocles' final play, not published, not um, produced in his lifetime, but produced by a grandson after his death, has Oedipus, this terrible man, having um, slept with his mother and uh, killed his father. He's a homicide, a patricide, and an incestuous man. In the end, this is Sophocles's, I think, resolution. If he can be received and become a kind of blessed spirit, for the, all the Athenians, not for the Thebans, notice he's come to Athens to die. Then that provides a very, as it were, happy ending. And that's quite unusual. Tragedy very often leaves one with a question mark. And in fact, I think that's part of its point. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, which is the right answer? Who knows? Go away and think. And that's part of education. Have a debate where you honestly face up to the possibilities on either side of an argument. And very often it is two-sided rather than multiply sided. Greeks were very binary, very polar sort of thinkers. And tragedy very often sets at risk some of the most basic values of your society. It might be honoring the dead by burial, but doesn't necessarily give you the answer to a specific case of conflict. Question about revolution, was there, Elizabeth? Could you um, just rephrase that for me? Yes. Um, what if Antigone decided to live and start a revolution? Yes, well, obviously in real life. A, she's an underage, she's a sub-adult female, and she would have been, what, 15? Because she's not married, remember, and women in ancient Greece, typically married at the age of um, about 15, 14, 15. So she can't be much older than that. Women simply um, were the unrepresented, the, as it were, suppressed half of a typical ancient Greek population. These princesses are very, very weird, dim, distant past figures. So no one, like anything resembling uh, an Antigone figure could possibly have in real life sparked uh, a revolution. As to revolution, the, the Greeks were ambivalent about that. 
As with the Romans who, who called revolutions new things, the, the Greeks had a very similar word. Revolution was not necessarily positive. You could never predict that it would come out well. I spoke of a revolution uh, happening in Athens 20 years before the Antigone. Well, it resulted in the murder, a political assassination of one of the two principal protagonists of the peaceful um, ballot box, as it were, democratic revolution. So was that good? And then the third question was something about the audience, Elizabeth? Um, yes, um, I'm afraid we might have to wrap up very soon, but yes, I'm going to read out that last question. Um, yeah, does the chorus represent also the voice of the people in the Antigone? Yes and no. In other words, sometimes the chorus in an ancient Greek play is actually an actor actually takes part in and takes the side of one or other of the main uh, antagonists. In others, this is an example, the chorus is, as uh, Paul O'Mahony brilliantly uh, presented himself, you know, a, a Theban, that's exactly what they do. They are actually elders, Paul is much too young. But um, insofar as the audience identified with a collectivity on the stage, insofar as that collectivity was speaking not just for themselves, but for their city, then the issue arises, are they speaking well? And then it's for the audience to decide, as with the individual actors, which side or which um, particular program or platform they think is best for the city. And always the ancient Greeks were typically collective minded. So what's best for the city? was often the question rather than what strictly is justice in any particular individual case. That's great. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. And thank you, Harold. That was brilliant. Um, I'm just, we've received some questions that we are, we, we don't have time to answer, but I'm going to read them out. And then I'm conscious Katie Marshall from the audience wanted to raise her hand and ask a question which Unfortunately, we don't have time to, but I'm just going to pop my email address in the chat. If you send me that question, I'll just make sure to send it, to share it with the relevant speaker. And just um, briefly reading out the last couple of questions that came through um, that I thought was, were brilliant. Um, would Augusta Boal's text, Theatre of the Oppressed, be a text that could be used as tool um, that could relate with what has been discussed today. Um, also, not a question, but a consideration. Fiat is very expensive today and very few can afford it. Today, fiat is not democratic, a huge difference with Greek theater. Um, and then last one, do we know how the Spartan defeat of Athens and subsequent rule of the 30 may have temporarily impacted theater's role in the political sphere of Athens? We don't have time to answer these questions, but so rich, insightful, and um, yeah, a big round of thanks to everyone involved. Uh, Professor Paul Cartridge, um, Harold Doffey, uh, Out of Chaos Theatre, with um, all the actors, um, I'm going to read out the names, Tim, Dalab, Tabitha Gale, uh, Paul Mahoney, and Natasha Majiji. Thank you to Paul Woodroff for translating the play. Um, to um, the wonderful app team, uh, to you in the audience, and of course, uh, to the Arts Council for making sure this event could happen. So thank you all, thank you so much. Oh, and there's a survey um, on that it would be great if you were able to complete, it helps us with our reporting. Um, but yeah, thank you so much and uh, have a nice evening, bye.